If you're hit by a suspected drunk driver and repeatedly call 911, you expect police to show up. That's not what happened in Seattle last month. King 5 investigator Linda Byron obtained dramatic 911 tapes of the calls for help. She joins us live with more. So these tapes paint a picture of two women desperate to get Seattle police to the scene of an accident before a drunk driving suspect can leave. But hours go by and police are a no-show. 911, what are you reporting? Oh, there was an accident outside. There was a car accident. At the accident happened during a busy commute along Lake City Way in North Seattle. Um, yes, I just was hit by a car on the corner of Lake City Way and Northeast 20th. Marianne Oxford was driving home from work. And the next thing I know, he pulls out in traffic. And I think he has to make a right-hand turn. That's a right-hand turn only sign. I know that is. But the driver goes straight. Hit his back passenger quarter panel. He spun around and then came back and hit me on my passenger door. He shot right out from there. Jennifer Asplin was driving by and saw it happen. He just sailed through there. And um, yes, I just was hit by Marianne the calls 911. It's just before 6 p.m. Um, his car is into my car, so I can't move it, and I'm blocking traffic significantly. Okay. Can you send someone right away? Okay. Jennifer had stopped just to leave her contact info but changes her plan when she sees the male driver. And when he got out and started walking, I thought, there is something wrong with him. He walked past me and I smelled booze right away. And I thought, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm staying here until the police get here. But 10 minutes later, they have not arrived. And I thought, this is really weird because we smell alcohol and nobody's coming, so I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call. She's the fourth person to call 911. And somebody had already called it in, but I actually saw the accident happen, and this guy appears to be very drunk um, and is kind of wanting to leave, and his car is smashed. Marianne's able to move partially onto a side street. We both went over here on 20. Still no officer. And then we waited and we waited. So she calls 911 again. Okay, you called earlier, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Marianne asked police to hurry and bring a breathalyzer. Okay, I'm not able to say how long it's going to take, ma'am, but we do have the call in. We're going to be out there as soon as we can. I've lost too many friends to drunk drivers. Uh, and I just did not want another drunk driver out on the road. But 49 minutes after the accident, police are a no-show. I've called once, but I'm in fear this guy's going to try to drive away, and he's extremely intoxicated. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I do see the call here. Jennifer it's emphasizes me. it's urgent. This guy actually smelled alcohol in his breath. I got close enough, so he is really hammered. The dispatcher says police are extremely busy. She'll update the call. Another 30 minutes go by, and then Jennifer does something that sounds unbelievable. I thought, fine, city of Seattle. I'm going to tell this guy to call because you know what? Let's get his voice all slurred. On the, on the microphone, on the dispatch, on recording, because when he goes out tonight and kills somebody because nobody responded, it's on your watch. 911, what are you reporting? Oh, car accident. Uh, no. This is the suspect it's, calling uh, 911. Lake City Way and 86th or 20th Avenue, heading south. He's slurring his words. Is anyone injured? No, no, we're fine, but we've been here for two hours. Okay. Trying to get somebody to come in. Is this the silver four-door truck in the Toyota Tacoma pickup? Yes, it is. Okay. The dispatcher recognizes the accident, yet twice she tells the suspected drunk driver he's free to go. If both drivers have Washington licenses and proof of insurance, it's not yeah, required yeah. to see an officer. You yeah, can't we've explain. already transferred all the information, so... Okay, it's not okay. required to wait for an officer. You can you can go ahead and leave. And Amazingly, he doesn't leave. The only thing I can think of is that he was so intoxicated and we were so insistent that he stay. It's been almost two hours. Marianne calls a third time. I think the gentleman who was drunk who hit me, I would like to have a breathalyzer done on him. And a fourth. And if somebody doesn't get here pretty soon with a breathalyzer, he's going to be sober. Okay, we do have the call and we haven't forgotten about you. It looks like we did have officers on the way to see you, but unfortunately they had to be diverted for an emergency that came up. Fed up with 911, they called directly here to the North Precinct. But they say the officer who answered was no help at all. She said, unfortunately, it's going to take a horrible accident in order for us to respond. Maybe you should take it up with your city leaders. 
That's when Marianne and Jennifer give up. I was mortified. Three and a half hours after the accident, they call the Washington State Patrol. Within minutes, a trooper is there and administering a field sobriety test. That gentleman uh, failed the light test. He failed the finger test. According to the trooper's report, the man blew a .111 at the scene, well over the legal limit. The next thing we saw, he was getting pulled out of the car with his hands in, in plastic cuffs and put in the back of the car. It's almost 10 o'clock, four hours after the accident. And I, honest to God, started to cry when he got the handcuffs put on because I thought, oh my God, we could have saved somebody's life. It took the state patrol just 35 minutes to get the call, drive to the scene, and make the arrest. Like, like I said, a, a knight in shining armor. I mean, he's our hero. Why didn't Seattle police come? And what the top brass are doing about it when we come back. Two women keep a DUI suspect at a crash scene for nearly four hours in North Seattle, repeatedly calling 911. I think the gentleman who was drunk who hit me, I would like to have a breathalyzer done on him. I just said, you have to send someone, please, you know. We don't know how long we can keep this man. As soon as he gets behind the wheel of his car, he can kill him. In this case. Seattle um, police never we show will, up. We are examining it and we will do what we can to try and fix it. Do you consider the lack of response acceptable? No. As commander of the North Precinct, Captain Sean O'Donnell has been tasked with fixing the problem of slow response times, which goes back years. He's been getting additional officers. The North Precinct is the largest precinct in the city. It's the but O'Donnell says several things were in play on the evening of January 14th. The crash happened around 5.50 p.m., right at the end of second watch, which was short officers that day. One administrative leave, three sick or SB. Okay, and then there was a funeral. Yeah. Just 19 officers were working instead of 25. And just as Marion Oxford's truck was being hit, another incident was monopolizing resources. We had a call with uh, a priority call that had actually 11 officers and two sergeants assigned. That was an elderly Alzheimer's patient uh, who was missing. But that patient was found at 6.09. 10 minutes after the first 911 calls coming in about the accident. And by 7, a whole new shift of officers was coming on duty. Yet no one was dispatched to the suspected DUI crash. Because Oxford's truck was no longer blocking traffic, dispatch had downgraded her incident and other calls and were taking collision, priority. Collision, rollover, robbery, suicide. Prowl. But officers were also sent to investigate a shoplift, a car prowl, and illegal dumping. The suspected DUI crash ignored. I called once, but I'm in fear this guy's going to try to drive away, and he's extremely intoxicated. It wasn't until 911 had received nine calls that a patrol car was dispatched two hours after the accident. The officer was diverted and never arrived. None of the supervisors ever went either, even though SPD staffing reports show one lieutenant and five sergeants came on duty around 7. So I think they were doing uh, what they felt was appropriate uh, at the time. I can tell you that uh, we have had those discussions since then, uh, and uh, the indication is that uh, we will be trying harder to get to calls in a prompt fashion. The Seattle Police Chief is more blunt in a written statement calling the lack of response unacceptable and the 911 center a fundamentally broken system that we are working hard to fix. It was a state trooper who finally showed up and arrested the suspected drunk driver. To this day, neither Marianne Oxford nor the witness who stayed to help her has received even a phone call from Seattle police. Well, I'd be happy to apologize to them right now and say that uh, in a perfect world or a, a perfect circumstance, we would have gotten there promptly and taken care of the uh, suspected DWI. We didn't do that and we're gonna try and fix uh, the issues that may have gone wrong here so that we can do that. Chief O'Toole sent this case to the Office of Professional Accountability to investigate what went wrong and to recommend any discipline. Now, as for the suspected drunk driver, we were not able to reach him, but he repeatedly told the trooper he had not been drinking. He blamed the smell of liquor on his dentures and his impaired behavior on diabetes. He was cited for DUI. Mm -hmm. They put an interlock device on his car, okay. and he's doing court next month. So the cars that stayed in the roadway 
maybe the response would have been more appropriate. They downgraded that call to a lower priority as soon as it was no longer blocking. I think that played a part. Mm -hmm. All right. Linda, fascinating story. Thanks, Thank you. Linda.